for the music. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our conversation about Black migration in the Americas, an invisible issue. My name is Marie Ferreira. I am the communications coordinator at Afro Resistance, and I'm going to give um, some information about how to use interpretation in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Olá a todas. Sejam muito bem-vindas a, a nosso, nossa conversa de hoje sobre migração negra nas Américas, um tema invisível. Meu nome é Marie Ferreira, sou coordenadora de comunicações da Afro Resistance e vou dar algumas informações sobre como usar a interpretação em português, inglês e espanhol. 
Olá a todos, muito bem-vindas. Meu nome é Mari Ferreira, sou coordenadora de comunicações de Afroresistência e vou dar algumas uh, informações sobre como usar a interpretação em português, inglês e espanhol para nossa conversação Migração Negra em Las Américas em tema Invisible. I'm first in English. So if you are on your computer, the interpretation is available at the bottom of your screen. Please check uh, a button in the format of a globe. Uh, click there and select English or Portuguese or Spanish. We have the interpretation available in the three languages. If you are using your cell phone, the interpretation is also available at the bottom of your screen. Please uh, check the three dots, uh, click there, select language service. Um, select English and then mute the original audio and press done. Don't forget to mute the original audio if you're using your uh, cell phone because then you'll be able to hear uh, the interpretation clearly. If you uh, have any questions about how to use interpretation, uh, I'm going to be available in the chat and you can also use the Q&A options to talk to us and to send questions to uh, the speakers. Uh, a interpretação está disponível uh, por telefone ou por celular. Se você está no seu por computador ou por celular, desculpa, se você está no seu computador, é, por favor, verifique a opção na parte de baixo da sua tela. É, tem um botão no formato de um globo, você pode clicar lá e selecionar português, uh, ou inglês ou espanhol. A interpretação está disponível nas três uh, línguas. Se você está usando seu telefone, por favor, verifique a opção também na parte de baixo da sua tela. Uh, tem três botões na parte de baixo, você pode clicar lá e selecionar, é, selecionar Língua de Service ou Serviços de Linguagem, é, caso esteja é, em inglês, e selecione Português, e sele, sele, selecione Português, clique em uh, mutar o áudio original e pressione OK, ou DONE, D-O-N-E, uh, se o seu um, Zoom estiver em in, inglês. In um, e aqui novamente mostrando a foto de como usar a interpretação é, no computador. É, se você tiver alguma dúvida sobre como usar a interpretação, eu vou estar disponível uh, através do chat, você pode me mandar alguma mensagem lá, e também é, pode usar a opção Q&A para enviar perguntas para a nossa equipe ou também para é, as participantes de hoje. É, uma coisa que eu também gostaria de ressaltar é que Zoom e outras tecnologias né, de chamada de vídeo elas foram criadas para levar adiante interesses de, de corporações, né, interesses privados. Então, é importante a gente lembrar que existe essa divisão tecnológica e de que, muitas vezes, é, ela acompanha a linguagem né? é, e nos impede de nos comunicarmos, também, também inclui conexões à internet. Então, a Foresistence é uma organização que tem, é, conta com speakers, colaboradores e é, participantes de diversas regiões das Américas, é, com diferentes acessos à internet. Então, nós trabalhamos para fazer a ponte né, entre essas divisões tecnológicas, mas tem muitas coisas que não podemos controlar, como fatores externos, como temporada de furacões, perda de eletricidade, etc., durante os nossos fóruns online. Então, a gente é, espera e conta com a, a colaboração e a paciência de todos vocês. Uh, just something that I, I'd like to remind her is that Zoom and other uh, conference video technologies were created to move corporates and priorities forward, right? So uh, we ask you to, to be aware that this technology divide exists and uh, it's accompanied by language that sometimes keeps us um, un unable to communicate with each other and it also includes internet connection especially when we have speakers and attendees and uh, collaborators from different regions of the Americas with different uh, access to the internet. The Afro and Afro is an organization that works to bridge um, these divides, but we cannot control uh, external factors such as hurricane, uh, hurricane seasons, uh, loss of electricity, uh, and etc. during our calls. So we ask uh, our community to please be patient and compassionate And if you need any support with um, technology at any time, you can contact us via the chat. Thank you. Bon, um, obrigada, Marie. Um, bienvenidas. Um, welcome everybody to our, our call today around migration 
Thank you so very much um, for being here with us today. Um, I want to first really thank from the bottom of our heart, Priscila Abro, um, Alexandra Gomez and Lamar Bailey, our interpreters. We are very intentional about providing interpretation as Marie explained. And we're also very intentional about bringing on black interpreters um, to these spaces because they understand idiosyncrasies and they understand our way of speaking, our way of being, which sometimes when things get lost in translation, this team of interpreters just really helps to bridge that loss in translations because they are part of our community. So the format today um, is meant to connect the communities, our guests today in our home, right? With international human rights mechanisms. And we really want to open the borders and fronteras, right? So hence the name Beyond Borders, Entre Fronteras, um, Entre Fronteras, right? So we are going to ask that you send us any questions, right? And I'm going to put a whole leap of, of links on the side to um, send any questions using the hashtag for folks that are watching us on Facebook. Um, send us any comments or questions using the hashtag Afro-Resistance, Entre Fronteras, Beyond Borders, Entre Fronteras, Black Women and Girls, and Afro-Resist. We will have somebody that will be monitoring our social media, and that includes our, our Twitter, and it includes um, our, our Facebook page as well, um, and responding as well. So if you could please make use of that, that would be great. For those of you that are joining us right here in the Zoom call, you can, um, there's a Q&A little hand at the bottom. If you could just click that, if you have questions for the presenters. If you have questions, um, sorry, if you have comments, um, or you wanna share an anecdote or something like that or information, please use the chat on the side um, because we that's a great source of sharing information, um, but keep the Q&A for the, for the presenters and myself as a moderator in, um, in the Q&A so we can keep it more organized. Thank you so very much. Now let's get, let's get into it. We have three amazing speakers with us. Um, our first speaker today were, will be Dr. Verine Shepard, who currently serves as a vice chairperson of the UN mm -hmm. Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. She is an honorary member of the International Women's Forum Jamaica. She's a radio show host talking history on Nationwide 90 FM Jamaica and a professor of social history at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Shepard is a consultant on reparatory justice and international speaker in human rights and a regional and international speaker on general topics on Caribbean history and gender issues and recognized across Jamaica as a public historian. She is a member of the advisors board of a few academic journals such as Small Acts, Slavery and Abolition, Caribbean Quarterly, as well as a member of the Jamaican Historical Society. We will also have with us, we also have with us, Gerline Joseph. Gerline Joseph is an activist, servant, mother, sister, niece, and wife. Ms. Joseph dedicates her life to bring awareness to issues that affect us at locally and globally, such as immigration, social justice, domestic violence, and child abuse. She is a co-creator of Faith in Action and Immigrant Justice Movement in Southern California and a four-part immigration program for both impacted communities and their allies. Ms. Joseph is the president of Haitian Bridge Alliance and the chairwoman of Word in Action, sorry, a nonprofit organization that aims to prevent and decrease the occurrence of child sexual abuse in our communities. She also serves as an advisor to Voices Against Violence in their effort to prevent domestic violence in California and around the world. Last but not least, we have Juanita C. Francis Bone, who has been with us before. So thank you very much for joining us again and keeping being part of our family. She is the, okay, just a second. She is the co-founder of Colectivo Mujeres de Asfalto, social activist for human rights, feminist. She has worked as a legislative advisor at the National Assembly of Ecuador, consultant on issues of protection and human trafficking, human mobility and others. 
Currently, she serves as the president of the Fundación de Acción Social e Integral Mujeres de Asfalto and a consultant on gender issues and activities to strengthen alternative political defense tools. She's the author of the poetry book, Rompe Cabezas. And in 2018, she was recognized as a defender of women's rights by the government of Canada, along with three more activists from Peru, Guatemala, and Haiti. She's a member of the anti-racist group, Re Existencia Cimarronas. So thank you so very much for, for being with us today. We will also have a, um, after our speakers share with us, we have a video question from the communities in the Americas, and then we'll open it up to address some of the comments and the questions that you as our viewing audience will share. So thank you so very much. And I will give Dr. Vadine Shepard um, the word as um, she explains to us what CERT is, how civil society can make use of these mechanisms, and a little bit exploring more the, the, the breadth of the mechanism and migration. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me begin by thanking Entre Fronteras for creating a space where community members and local activists from historically Black territories in the Americas can interview international human rights professionals. While I will locate my opening statement within the context of the work of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which we call CERD, I want us to bear in mind the overarching context of this UN International Decade for People of African Descent, 2015 to 2024. It is intended to address issues of invisibility where that occurs. And so we always have to keep it in the forefront of our minds and our activities. Equality and human rights are aspirations that underpin both the CERD and the International Decade for People of African Descent, the latter having the tripartite theme of recognition, justice, and development. The decade offers the opportunity for states to make concrete changes in the daily lives of millions of Afro-descendants who populate the world, but especially the Americas, as well as for people of African descent to proclaim their right to non-discrimination and to press for change. As a member of CERD, I can attest that it can be a space for communities on the ground to bring their issues to an international space. More specifically, since the proclamation of the decade, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has routinely encouraged states parties to launch and develop action plans for the IDPAD, even those with very small populations of people of African descent. Anti-Black racism does not rest solely on the presence of a large population of African people. Prejudice develops out of history and the historical experiences of Black people. So a little bit more on the CERD. This is a body of independent experts that monitors implementation of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination by its state parties. The ICERD, that is the convention, is made up of articles or paragraphs that specify mm -hmm. rights to be upheld and the avenues that can be taken by those whose rights have been infringed. It falls under the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the current High Commissioner, of course, is Michelle Bachelet. There are 18 of us and it's the only gender balanced treaty body right now, nine men and nine women. There are not as many people of African descent as we would like, but we are getting there on the third. Members are independent experts, so we do not represent our countries, although we are nominated by our countries who then have election officers who lobby for our election. Currently members are from Algeria, Belgium, Brazil, China, Cote d'Ivoire, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Jamaica, Japan, Mauritania, Mauritius, Peru, Qatar, Senegal, South Africa, South Korea, and Turkey. Members serve for four years, but can be re-elected. 
And I have noticed um, recently that states do not like, you know, to elect people if they have served more than two, two terms. The third meets in Geneva um, three times per year, but of course, only virtually now. We have a session next week. We can only meet virtually. And we can talk in the Q&A about the downside of that. All states parties are obliged to submit regular reports to the committee on how the rights are being implemented. The committee examines each report and addresses its concerns and recommendations to the state party in the form of what we call concluding observations. In addition to the reporting procedure, the convention establishes three other mechanisms that you need to know about through which the committee performs its monitoring functions. Early warning procedure in cases of urgent action needed in a human rights related case. The examination of interstate complaints where states can settle their disputes themselves. And the examination of individual complaints. So as long as your country is a party to the ICERD, as long as you try to get attention from the state for human rights violation and you got no satisfaction, you can complain to the committee. There is a special subcommittee for that task. And you can get more details on our website. I cannot stress enough that the treaty body system depends on the active engagement with non-state actors. And we at the CERD are always heartened by the level of interest displayed by NGOs and CSOs, as well as by human rights advocates in our work. Implementation the full implementation of the International Convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination must be understood as an essential means of achieving peace and reconciliation in the world among states and within states. The ICERD repudiates colonial era biological theories of race, reminding us that state parties of the convention affirm their belief that any doctrine of superiority any doctrine of superiority based on racial discrimination or differentiation is scientifically false, morally condemnable, socially unjust and dangerous, and that there is no justification for racial discrimination in theory or practice anywhere. Furthermore, with the adoption of the convention, states parties explicitly recall the racial, the racial discrimination endemic in colonialism. As a special rapporteur on racism stressed in her recent report, the convention provides a solid blueprint for dismantling racially discriminatory structures, including those rooted in historical injustices. The effective protection of individuals from forms of racial discrimination requires access to justice, pursuit of accountability, reparations, guarantees of non-recurrence and the elimination of impunity. Furthermore, the convention requires states parties to pursue by all appropriate means and without delay, a policy of eliminating racial discrimination in all its forms and anticipates the necessity of special measures or affirmative action taken for the sole purpose of securing adequate advancement of certain racial or ethnic groups or individuals requiring such protection as may be necessary in order to ensure such groups or individuals equal enjoyment or exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms. The articles of the convention outline the rights that the ICER tries to encourage states to protect. They spell out the definition of racial discrimination, the prohibited grounds of racial discrimination, address racist hate speech, social, cultural, economic, civil, and political rights, states obligations to provide suitable reparation for rights that are violated and steps to be taken to eliminate racial discrimination. Finally, it is the concluding observations that make concrete recommendations to address the issues of concerns raised. These are intended to isolate areas where state parties might be falling down on their obligation under the convention. As the introduction to the ECLAC report on people of African descent in Latin America and the Caribbean, developing indicators to measure and counter 
inequalities states, and I quote, the persistent statistical invisibility of people of African descent is another expression of structural racism. Breaking this statistical silence is one element of the enormous challenges and pending tasks that we face in the region today. In this context, data and information emerge as fundamental tools for the design, implementation, and monitoring of actions aimed at guaranteeing the rights of people of African descent. Data, as we know, and information are a powerful catalyst for progress and essential to the construction of fair and egalitarian activities. So I will end there and uh, uh, await uh, the discussion that will follow. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias, Dr. Averin. Um, thank you so very much. Before we move on to um, Gerline, we would like to remind people that Afro Resistance, um, our purpose is, our mission is to educate and organize for racial justice um, um, in the region, in the Americas. And we are a volunteer driven organization. We have, I just posted on the side, um, the donation link because we do have a black girls and women's fund where we actually get money directly in the hands of black girls and women in communities in latin america and here that are from latin america and the caribbean so please we are trying to raise you know we have over 100 people on the call so we're trying to raise at least a thousand dollars today so please go ahead and donate and we're also going to be launching a membership based structure in december so any donation over fifty dollars you will be automatically a member um, ahead of time and we'll talk about that a little bit later so thank you so very much and girlene i'm going to hand it over to you um and girlene is going to bring us a lot of information that you might not have heard before <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Sister Genevieve and, and Dr. Shepard. Thank you so much. Um, again, as um, my dear sister mentioned, my name is Gerlin Joseph and I am co-founder, executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance and the Black Immigrants Bell Fund. Uh, wow, it is amazing to see so many phenomenal women. The melanin that is coming to me through the screen is fantastic, it's, it's hopeful, it's rejuv rejuvenating. It really gives me the, 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 the strength I have to be able to share uh, uh, with you today. Um, as Genevieve mentioned, things maybe we, we, we have experienced ourselves, but have kept and people do not know what, 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 what we have been dealing with as Black immigrants, as people of African descent in the diaspora. Um, I will be focusing today on migration of Black people currently from the Caribbean, Haiti, Jamaica, Belize, Afro, Latinx, from, uh, from, from Honduras, from Guatemala, from Cuba, and also look into our brothers and sisters migrating from Africa, from Cameroon, from the Congo, from Angola, from Eritrea, you name it, we have seen it. And I can also give you a brief background of who we are at, as the Haitian Bridge Alliance, why we started the bridge, why we forged alliance. In 2015, we started to see a flow of black immigrants, of black migrants in the border of US Mexico. And we were called to, to come to simply see what can be done to assist black bodies at the border. In 2016, we formally established the Haitian Bridge Alliance. But one thing I want to share from the beginning is that we were called because there were a need for Haitian migrants at the border. But once we arrived, we realized, as I mentioned, we had brothers and sisters from Cameroon, from Eritrea, from Jamaica, from Belize, from Honduras, 
we went for the Haitians, we stayed for everyone because that's what was needed at the moment and that what continues to, 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 to drive us today. Um, so just a brief background, let me start with the Haitian migrants. After the earthquake, for those of us who do not know, in, 2018, in 2010, there was a massive earthquake in Haiti that killed over 250,000 people that day, leaving millions of people completely lost, leaving a country literally in scramble. And so we understand that people migrated under humanitarian uh, program to Brazil at that time was getting ready for the Olympics, for the World Cup. We all know how we get when it's football season, when it's soccer season, and we come in and, and we, we enjoy that. So Haitians always had this thing for Brazilian football. So it was interesting to see them migrating from Haiti after the earthquake as survivors, people who lost their mothers, their friends, their families, their homes were able to go to Brazil. Unfortunately, the economy of Brazil collapsed because the revenues that we're expecting from the World Cup and, 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 um, and the Olympics did not happen. As a result, we also saw the political system also collapsed. And unfortunately, the first people to feel the weight of the system, to feel unwanted, even, you know, me personally growing up as a children was always taught that Brazil is one of the countries that has the most number of, of Black people out of, uh, you know, um, outside of Nigeria. So to me, the racism was a troubling, knowing the composition, the racial composition of Brazil. But the new immigrants from Haiti and also from Africa were the one to feel the weight of the system and literally pushed out. Now, we have a group of people literally walking from Brazil, crossing the entire South and Central America, crossing every single country, every single border to make it to Tijuana, to make it to Matamoros, to make it to Rio Grande, to come and ask for asylum in these United States of ours, because we have sold the world this idea that we give freedom, this idea that we, 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 we give opportunities, this idea that we still stand under the banner of the Statue of Liberty and welcome people. Unfortunately, it was a mistake when it came to newly arriving migrants, specifically Black migrants, from the Caribbean in, in, in uh, Africa, who then the first, um, the first obstacle is the language. They do not speak Spanish, right? And that turns into even more difficulties as they make it uh, the journey. It is painful to say that a lot of people have lost their lives in the mountain of Colombia in the weavers of Panama, in the jungle in Nicaragua, lives have been lost, countless lives of babies and children and mothers and men, black bodies in motion being destroyed, being lost along the way. So just to give you an idea of the journeys of Black migrants throughout the Americas to come here. Now, under President Obama in 2016, right before the elections, P 
people were given what is called another humanitarian parole, what is the current administration has been calling catch and release to take away the humanity of somebody coming and ask for help. So those first wave between 2015 and, and August 2016, those people were allowed in with a humanitarian parole and we were able to then create a system to help them get their social security, get employment, get them ID, and make sure they have a strong platform, a strong foundation so that they can build and survive as they continue the process. Unfortunately, as soon as the current president became in power, those people were no longer being released to meet their families and continue the process. They started putting them in immigration prison. So now we are seeing a coming together of the immigration system and the criminalization system and caging black bodies inside of the country as they have done with our ancestors for over 400 years. Understanding that the immigration prison system as we know it today started with black Haitians coming in the 1980s alongside the Cubans. However, the light-skinned Cubans that were closer approximate to whiteness were allowed in, but the dark-skinned black Haitian refugees were put in, were put in, in cages in Guantanamo Bay to create the system that we see today. We also- Two minutes, Gerlene, uh, sorry. Two more minutes. Yeah, so we also can touch really briefly on, on, on what's happening in country. And one thing I want to also stress is that as immigrants, as Black immigrants in this country, our status, our citizenship does not protect us. And when we even look into the immigration system itself, the non-existent, the non-narrative, the erasure of Black and, and including Afro-Latinx brothers and sisters is another testament of the anti-Blackness and ingrained racism, not only in these United States of ours, but in Central America, where we're still fighting in the Dominican Republic anti-Blackness in a Black country. When we look into Cuba and other places, so I, I will stop here, but to give us a context of what it looks like to be Black in the diaspora, to be a Black immigrant in this United States. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, um, Gerlene. Um, and I'm going to hand it over now to Juanita. Oh, I hope we haven't lost. Aquí estoy, hola. Ceci, <laughs> bienvenida, Juanita. Te, te cedo la palabra. Ok, hola con todas, con todos y todes. Me da mucha alegría eh, estar compartiendo con ustedes hoy y sobre todo un tema que me apasiona, que es sobre todo hablar sobre movilidad humana. Y mucho más cuando hablamos sobre movilidad eh, y le damos además una carga histórica, sobre todo con la población negra o afrodescendiente en las Américas. Y creo que eh, para mí es importante hacer como un ejercicio histórico y hay que hablar que nuestras migraciones no solamente eh, acontecieron con el tema del de proceso de esclavización, que además es como la mancha de dolor en nuestra memoria colectiva histórica, sino que también hay que hablar de otros momentos de historia que también nos, nos datan ¿no? los historiadores sobre un ejercicio de que ya había una migración mucho anterior de los pueblos africanos o negros hacia las Américas. Y, eh, y es importante que hablemos de eso desde, desde también una memoria colectiva y el sostén de esa memoria colectiva hasta el, 2000, hasta el, hasta el 2020, ¿no? hasta la actualidad. Y eso lo hago como un ejercicio necesario porque hay que recordar, y yo siempre digo, nuestra memoria colectiva, sobre todo nuestra memoria diaspórica, es una memoria de ciencia y conocimiento y de tecnología. Y arriesgarnos a decir eso es irruptivo también para los espacios, 
porque es reconocer algo que la historia no es escrita por nosotras o nosotres, está escrita además por aquellos que quieren no sea visible esa existencia de saber y de conocimiento. Eh, yo soy de Ecuador, <ríe> Ecuador geográficamente está súper bien ubicado en el planeta, como todos, eh, como todos nuestros territorios, pero Ecuador tiene una locura y es que es un país estratégico para migración. Y la gente me va a decir, ¿y por qué estás diciendo eso sobre Ecuador? Pero Ecuador es un país que no solo sirve de acogida para la población migrante, sino que también es un país de tránsito por su ubicación geográfica, y es un país que también expulsa migración. Y eso lo ha pasado históricamente. Pero también es importante hablar de esa migración positiva y de reconocer que la migración hasta la, para la actualidad tiene una carga de un mal contenido y una mala observancia sobre la seguridad. Entonces todo lo migrante es inseguro para los estados y eso ha generado una criminalización de los cuerpos migrantes. Y vamos a otra etapa de lo que significa ser una mujer migrante en las Américas. En cualquier parte del mundo, una mujer no, eh, no nacional de su territorio, o sea, que es una persona en situación de movilidad humana, una mujer migrante, tiene una carga de por sí ya de inseguridad en su, en su, en su frente, pero mucho más cuando somos mujeres negras. ¿Qué significa ser mujer negra en las Américas y una mujer migrante en las Américas? te genera también que todas estas violencias de las que solemos hablar en algunos momentos eh, está reinstitucionalizada y justificada en la palabra seguridad. Entonces yo me atrevería que en estos momentos, cuando hablemos sobre la migración y la invisibilidad de la mujer negra en las Américas, es necesario y oportuno eh, tener en mente o con mucha claridad que hay que desconstruir conceptos como el de la mujer migrante el de seguridad, el de comunidad y el de reconocimiento. Y el otro, que a mí me parece como que muy interesante y que creo que es necesario como, como explayarlo un poco más, es el tema y la necesidad de hablar sobre la representación de las mujeres migrantes en las Américas y sobre todo la representación de las mujeres migrantes negras. Y esto porque hay una carga de aporte y no lo que, bueno, está mal que lo llama carga, pero hay un, hay un plus de aporte a las construcciones sociales y comunitarias y políticas de las mujeres migrantes. Y eso, eh, como, como una referencia, eh, podemos hablar de quiénes hacen el trabajo comunitario, desde qué parte lo están haciendo o elaborando, y, eh, y cómo se, se, va, se va visibilizando eso de una forma material en las migraciones. Cuando hablamos sobre la criminalidad de, la, de los cuerpos negros a, a nivel de migratorio, ahí justamente también se justifica la invisibilidad. Porque cuando hablan de la migración negra, hablan de una migración negra de vergüenza. Entonces, ¿quién quiere contar sobre la vergüenza de los migrantes negros? Nadie quiere contar. Pero eso no es, y yo creo que ahí no hay, yo voy a usar la frase de una compañera colombiana, Marcia Santa Cruz, que siempre nos dice, no debemos pecar de ingenuas o ingenuos, cuando se trata de agendas políticas. Y la agenda política de invisibilizar la negritud en temas de migratorios no es una cuestión de ingenua, ¿no? es una cuestión intencionada, porque el aporte de las personas migrantes y de los cuerpos negros, de la migración además, cuando esta migración se genera por temas de conflicto armado, que además es una carga, que además y eso sí lo puedo llamar una carga, que pasó en su momento con la migración colombiana hacia los demás países de la región, por temas del conflicto armado. La ola migratoria fue alta, ¿no? uno de los censos más grandes que hemos tenido en el Ecuador fue con Colombia, y este animal, yo digo, el animal del prejuicio, se empezó a expander como un virus, ¿no? y toda la carga que había sobre la población colombiana, sobre las violencias, sobre el tema de narcotráfico, sobre los cuerpos de las mujeres negras además, con relacionarla simplemente a temas de prostitución y no reconocer además que cuando tú viajas o cuando estás en situación de movilidad, te estás trasladando con tus saberes. Y ahí venimos y es urgente hablarlo y hay que discutirlo además, porque en el caso de Ecuador, nuestras familias, yo soy de la zona fronteriza justamente con Colombia, y nuestras familias eh, somos familias binacionales y hemos construido además nuestro vínculo 
eh, decimos nosotros somos de la costa pacífica y eso ya nos representa. O sea que nuestras fronteras trascendieron mucho más y construimos el vínculo de sostenibilidad eh, cultural, porque además si tú ves nuestras prácticas alimenticias, de formación comunitaria, de incidencia política, no es, no es accidental que sea similar. Y rescatar también que, esa, que ese vínculo migratorio en las Américas ha sido también un sostén para la memoria colectiva. En estos momentos yo puedo decir que la migración negra se ha sostenido y es gracias a la construcción de nuestras memorias colectivas. Y como, se, y como último, para ir como que ordenando y cerrando las ideas, es importante hablar de la diversidad de violencias cuando las actorías de las mujeres negras en temas migratorios se hace visible. La violencia política, la violencia institucional, la violencia de género, además, en esas actorías, la invisibilidad intencional de la palabra. Y yo solo quiero en estos momentos, no por, por hacerme publicidad, pero cuando estoy viviendo ahora un, un, un tema de participación política eh, directa, y puedo decir que no podemos hablar de un sistema que está desarrollándose, no podemos hablar de democracias en la región o en el mundo, no podemos hablar de, no podemos hablar de participación política si nuestra voz, actoría y visibilidad política está presente. No hay forma de que me puedas hablar de un sistema democrático si la voz de las mujeres negras en diversidad, en interseccionalidad, si son mujeres migrantes o no, esas voces son visibles. Y ahí les dejo eh, para poder conversar todo ese collage de ideas. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Juanita. Muchísimas gracias, Gerlene. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. Vereen. Um, we, and I, it's hard for me to switch from English to Spanish sometimes, but for the interpreters, I'm going to keep it in one language. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure to use the Q&A little button at the bottom um, and click it there. We will not be opening up the microphone. So if you raise your hand, we're not going to be able to get to you. But if you put it on the on the Q&A, we will definitely get to it. And if you have comments or resources to share, go ahead and put them on the chat yourself. We are now going to, we have a question. We have a video question. That's one of the things that we, that we have um, during these calls. We will have a question that, that was from one of the community members. This question is coming specifically from, um, from Brazil. Um, and we would like to really thank Beto, who is the person that made the question for this. And Marie will be putting up that video in a split second. Marie, can you unpin me? Olá pessoal, é, chamo-me Beto Infante, sou da, da Guiné-Bissau, atualmente no Brasil, sou graduado e mestrando em Relações Internacionais pela Universidade Federal da Bahia, Brasil, é, sou professor, sou ativista e trabalho para coletivo de entidades negras Uh, da Bahia, Brasil. E eu começo por agradecer a querida Ana por me convidar e por fazer questões uh, aos nossos ilustres e às nossas ilustres palestrantes. E, falando de, de, de imigração uh, africana, eu, o que vem logo na minha mente é... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna play the video again with subtitles in English.
So as we said before, we cannot control technical difficulties. Um, and this is part, you know, we did not create these things and these things were not cre certainly not created for us. Um, so we are making use, the best use that we can um, of the technology and really being intentional to, um, to, bridge, to bridge, right? Um, and to close gaps. You see the, do you see the video? Yes. Okay. Hola, pessoal. Uh, Chamo-me Beto Infante. Uh, sou da, da Guiné-Bissau. Uh, atualmente no Brasil. Sou graduado e mestrando em Relações Internacionais pela Universidade Federal da Bahia, Brasil. É, sou professor, sou ativista e trabalho para coletivo de entidades negras uh, da Bahia, Brasil. E eu começo por agradecer a querida Ana por me convidar e por fazer questões uh, aos nossos ilustres e às nossas ilustres palestrantes. E falando de, de, de imigração uh, africana, eu, o que vem logo na minha mente é Uh, saber que a migração africana não é igual à migração uh, de outros povos, é uma migração que foi brutalmente uh, construída uh, pelo sistema ocidental racista, né, é, que brutalizou o nosso povo, né, é, que tratou o nosso povo como como é, o animal, como é, máquina de produção, e, e isso é, trouxe uma diferença enorme até hoje na sociedade, principalmente aqui nas Américas. Então, para isso, eu faço a minha questão, que é a seguinte, é, como lutar né, é, por direitos humanos, e, levando em consideração que as maiores organizações que lutam por direitos humanos, como Nações Unidas e, e mais outros, são ainda lideradas pelas pessoas brancas que não sintam na pele o que nós negros sentimos? Isso é a minha questão. E, e outra questão, é, essa luta de pacificidade, a luta pacífica é, por direitos humanos, não é outra forma de controlar, manter o sistema é, racista que continua matando os negros até hoje? E, por fim, será que podemos chamar os Estados Unidos, ou como o Brasil, onde os, os negros são mais assassinados de países democráticos? Se sim, que tipo de democracia estamos falando? E agradeço e um grande abraço a todos e a todas. Thank you, thank you very much. So we are um, we are going to hand it over to Dr. Vereen <laughs> okay. to address that question. Okay, so. Thank you for your questions. Well, actually there are questions, not just one okay. question. But I really wanted to pick up first on something that Beto said in, in his kind of lead in um, remarks, because he said that, you know, um, he made an interesting observation about migration, about black migration and African migration. He says, what comes to mind is knowing that African migration is not like the migrations of other people. It's a migration that was built by a racist Western system that brutalized our people. So he's interpreting the use of migration in the title of this event as the historic movement of people. But when I listen to Gerline, that's not what we're talking about, but, but they are connected. The attitudes to migrants now, the attitude to black people who are migrants around the world is located within the historic trafficking of enslaved people. The, 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 the stereotypes have been built up because, because of that. So I wanted to make that point. Um, and to say to Beto, if we're talking about that forced relocation of people, we don't use migration, I think, because it conjures up an image of voluntarism, which it was not. So we talk in terms of the Ma'afa, the Ma'angamizi, 
the African Holocaust. This is how we think about it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, recently people are talking about the death rate on that uh, Marfa and asking for the Atlantic Ocean where sharks followed the ships, the, the slavers to be declared a kind of memorial. And I think that maybe that's something that we could all, um, you know, unite around. Now, to the question, the particular question, he asked, first of all, how can we fight for human rights? Taking into account that the largest organizations working on human rights, such as the United Nations and others, are still led by white people who do not feel in their skin what we Black people feel. Now, I think what I would like to say is that I don't think for third, the, the color of people's skin, the ethnicity of the members of the committee affect the concluding observations that we made, we make mm -hmm. at the end of the examination of states, when states come before us. And there are enough, if you look at the other treaty bodies, there are enough, you know, people who are not white right across the UN system who I think are fighting for human rights. So I think that that is what I, I would say. We're all as treaty body members fighting for human rights. We operate within the context of our terms of reference or mandate the convention that we're implementing. Uh, so of course you're going to find individual individuals who may have, you know, their own prejudices. But I think if those are ever aired in our meetings, then they are completely um, questioned. The second question is about the peaceful struggle for human rights. He asks, isn't another way of trying to maintain the racist system that continues to kill black people uh, today? Well, there are 10 treaty bodies of the United Nations that are supposed to be working along with the Human Rights Council to uh, call on states to uphold human rights. And in the decade, as you know, uh, and I was, I was there as chair of the working group when we battled to get the, the decade. So there was a black woman in the chair ensuring that we were fighting for human rights and getting this decade for people of African descent. So if state parties to the convention fail to uphold the rights, then, you know, this, the, if, if we fail to uphold the rights then the system won't change. But if we work to ensure that we do what we're supposed to do, then I think, um, you know, we, we, we will have some success and we have been having some success over the 75 years of the, um, the UN. And I know, and I would be dishonest if I don't admit that there have been complaints about people who wear UN IDs, people who are in the field and who contravene the high ideals of the United Nations. Um, my sister from Haiti is here. We have heard the complaints there. But what I know also is that systems are put into place to ensure that people who commit wrongs against anyone in the um, in any country in which UN people are, are located are held to, to account. Maybe not as quickly as, as many people would like, but uh, they actually do. Right now, within the context of Black Lives Matter, this is an opportunity for the United Nations to also engage with people of African descent on their complaints. And I know that there is a committee now chaired by the High Commissioner um, holding consultations, NGOs are invited to send reports about what are we going to do? How are we going to um, act in the interest of people of African descent um, in this context of, of, of Black Lives uh, Matter? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to adju adjust my, my system here a little bit. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for yeah. understanding. Okay. Um, and then can we call the United States or Brazil? That's a third question. It's a three, it's a three, it's three questions, really. Yeah. Um, can we call the United States or Brazil where black people are disproportionately murdered, democratic countries? Well, 
all of these countries have democratic structures of government, people vote and so on. But we have to ensure that the rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are upheld by states. It is the human part of that term that is the problem, you know? So as long as racism underpins the policies and practices of any society, the label of undemocratic will be attached um, parasitically uh, to that country. So we, collectively, we have work to do to ensure that we correct this. Um, and yes, um, as I said, there are criticisms of governments. There are, in many countries, there are governments, there are political parties. Some are not democratic in terms of how they operate. Some are conservative. And we all know where they are today. But I'm not so sure that that can be laid at the feet of one organization. I think a lot of us collectively have to take responsibility. But as human rights defenders, we have to call out on democratic systems wherever they are. And those of you who monitor the CERD, if you ever join the public sessions, and there are public sessions next week, by the way, you should join. Mm -hmm. Notice that we defend the rights of migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, and we try to educate people about the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and refugees. In the case of Haiti, and I'm so happy my neighbor, my sister who is my neighbor, I'm from Jamaica, and we're neighbors. I'm glad you spoke about anti-Black racism attached to Haitians and the difference between Cuban, the treatment of Cuban Americans and Haitian Americans. All of us in, in this world owe a debt of gratitude to Haiti. We forget that when Haiti fought for its freedom, Haiti said to the world, those of you who still have slavery, if you can get to Haiti, granted Haitian citizenship and freedom. In 1817, a boat from Jamaica, enslaved Africans stowed away, arrived in Haiti. And when the merchant asked Petion back for quote unquote property, Petion said, you can get the boat, come for it. But people who reach Haiti, they are citizens of Haiti. They are not property. Simon Bolivar benefited from that generosity of Haiti in fighting for uh, Venezuela and, and you know, the Bolivarian Republic. So we have to understand the roots, that there's a connection between the current migration and the, and the original Ma'afa. Mm -hmm. And sure that in our processes, in the way we operate, we bring understanding. And that's why we have independent experts from different parts of the world battling and calling out the UN in fact, when we see actions that are not consistent. And the final thing I'll say um, to prove this is that our people have always been moving. You know, after emancipation, people have been moving for opportunities. Mm -hmm. It might seem voluntarily, voluntary in the post-independence period, but remember, push factors out of your country are sometimes related to oppressive regimes and lack of opportunities, and that's why people have to move. But if we are going to live in a peaceful world, we'll have to understand that as a collective, we have to protect the rights of everyone. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because there, there may be other uh, question, questions uh, coming up. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to- See, oh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually hand it over to you, um, Gerline. And I'm going to add, right? Um, so we have a question specifically to Gerline as well from, from France, Francois, who is also a very good friend of um, Afro Resistance. How, how can people support Black immigrants along the borders? And what is the role in their government in keeping them safe, right? So this is a, an important question. And then um, adding to that, and this is both for Gerline and for Juanita. And this is from Sheila. Um, when people migrate, they're going, they're actually going to countries that have not, oh, I lost the, hold on. The question suddenly 
disappeared. Oh no. Okay, here we go. When people uh, migrate, they're going to countries that have not left the countries where people are migrating from. And there is no link really between we are here because they are there, right? So specifically talking about the United States, UK, France, Brussels, et cetera, et cetera. And they could be there in the name of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, USAID, et cetera, et cetera. So we go to the land of perpetual oppressors, right? Would you say, would all of you say, not say that we have an actual right to be here, right? So I'm gonna give the word to, to Gerlene to expand on what Dr. Vereen had spoken about and then to also address the incoming questions. And thank you very much for folks. Um, and then we also have some questions that I'll speak, that I'll share after Gerlene that are coming from, from Facebook. Uh, thank you so much. Geneviève, how much time do I have? I was on mute. I would say around four minutes. Okay. All right. And, and I want to start by saying thank you so much to Dr. Shepard for her presence uh, 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 on the stage uh, where she is representing us. She is she's making sure that our voices are being heard. Uh, and I would like to speak to our brother uh, um, from his message in solidarity to let him know that we hear him, we feel him, we understand him, and we are with him. And, and, and because of that, we will continue to hold people accountable to hold the UN accountable and, and, and not to put everything on the shoulder of our queen, uh, Dr. Shepard, but to continue to ask her to make sure that those conversations do not get lost. And, and, and we bring to the table requesting that those voices are, are part of the conversation that we actually bring in live experiences into the decision making and moving forward. Um, I will try to answer some of the questions and, and touching on the fact that maybe starting with the last question, uh, Geneviève, uh, saying about the relationship, right, between uh, former colonies and the colonizers, um, touching uh, maybe Let's take a, 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 a classic example. When we had Jamaican nurses going to, to England to serve and care for the population, yet they themselves did not have access to care and were treated as second-class citizens, right? And when we even look at the audacity of France and their counterpart, the United States, Spain, England, Portuguese, Portugal, to force Haiti to pay them for our freedom after we fought and won, which then create, as Dr. Shepard mentioned, the continued need of enslaving a population of people and forcing them into poverty and then label that same thing they have created as undesirable. Understanding the historical aspect of things and understanding, let's take Haiti as, as, as an example, understanding Haiti stand for Black liberation, Haiti stand for of Black power, of Black freedom, of what we are as a people and can continue to be. And understanding the, the, the system was created to make sure that Haiti fails at every single step of the way to prove to Black people around the world that we always have to be subject to white supremacy. 
always subject to colonization and always subject to anti-blackness. Mental slavery is at play. And as we look right now with our brothers and sisters in Cameroon who are fighting a system left by the French and the British creating a platform for disaster. Now we see a black nation turning into itself, turning into its people because of an access, because of a language that have divided the very essence of the family. So we see the continuance of anti-blackness of the system of slavery in country, out of country. We see our brothers and sisters in throughout South and Central America being imprisoned in their own countries, in Nicaragua, in, in, in Colombia, in Chile, in Venezuela. We see our people still being in those conditions. Um, so there is so much we can look into and bring out of how deep and ingrained that racism has been created for us to be in the condition and position that we are today. And it is again up to us to break those barriers, to enforce who we are to make sure that we empower one another as Afro resistance continues to do, to bring, empower, and communicate, and collaborate in partnership, understanding that my freedom is connected to yours, and that you and I cannot be free unless you and I are both free. Um, there's another uh, uh, um, question I'm trying to bring that into is how do we support black bodies as they move right through forced migration because the majority of people who are living are living because they have to, they need to, right? How do we support and protect black bodies as they move through that system? What we have done at the Haitian Bridge Alliance, we started a cash assisted pro program for black migrants in Mexico. Because of, of coronavirus, we can no longer do our biweekly trip to bring doctors and nurses and, and food to the people. We actually create a system where we give them cash assistance to be able to survive through that journey. And when we come to the United States, one thing I want to, to, to bring to your attention is that Black immigrants have to, all immigrants basically, but specifically Black immigrants have to pay a high bond in order for them to get released from immigration prison. So imagine, you barely escape this armed conflict in, 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 in Cameroon or in Eritrea, or barely survive the earthquake in Haiti, or you are a, uh, a gay man or a trans woman in Jamaica, you barely escape to make your way to the border, you get imprisoned, and then you have to pay $50,000 for you to get released. So that is why the Haitian Bridge Alliance with our partner Abisa in Michigan, created the Black Immigrants Bell Fund to be able to pay for the fifty thousand dollars for Brother Michelle from Cameroon to be after being in prison for two years with high blood pressure and all kind of risk in COVID nineteen to get him released for for fifty thousand dollars to be able to pay for our sister from Cuba with a $20,000 bail, to be able to pay for men from Haiti with a $35,000 bail. So our freedom is always conditioned and the price that we have to pay is always higher. So as we continue to support, for example, the, 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 the Women and Girl Initiative from Afro Resistance, 
we have to come together and support one another, the Haitian Bridge Alliance, the Black Immigrants Bell Fund, and, and we are here waiting for all of us to continue that journey together. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so very much. We are going to add on um, before I, I give it, hand it over to Juanita. And we have some questions from uh, Facebook. Thank you very much for people that are watching us in Facebook. So the question is when people migrate today, oh, we already got that one. Uh, what guidance may be offered to grassroots community-based organizations, not NGOs, not INGOs, to hold their states accountable as it relates to this decade? Best practices that maybe have been successful in other Caribbean countries. So I think that's um, a question more for Dr. Vereen, but I'm gonna hand the word over to Juanita first and then come back to that. Juanita? Hola, ahí. <laughs> yeah. eh, primero que yo quiero recordarles algo y ya demostramos que el mundo nos pertenece, ¿no? O sea, somos ciudadanos y ciudadanas del mundo. Y la diáspora lo ha, lo ha reafirmado además con la sostenibilidad de su memoria colectiva. Yo insisto mucho en eso porque quiero como reconocer el valor además histórico que tenemos en el tema de migración y movilidad humana como tal. Eh, el, el, y creo que hay que hacer también como un ejercicio de descolonizar el empoderamiento y darle el, el reforzamiento a la palabra conocimiento, ¿no? El saber, la ciencia está ahí. Y esos son unos aportes que indudablemente la historia no lo puede borrar. Y en estos momentos políticos hay que politizarlo mucho más, además el insistir en nuestro saber y nuestro conocimiento como tal. Y me voy a saltar porque siento que las dos la compañeras que me precedió lo explicó demasiado bien. Y me voy a saltar a la pregunta de lo del decenio. Y bueno, en el caso de Ecuador existe además un acuerdo ministerial que dejó el anterior presidente. Estamos con un actual presidente que eh, nos borró además. <ríe> este de acá hizo el ejercicio práctico de lo que habíamos logrado con una incidencia y con un trabajo desde las organizaciones sociales. El de acá nos borró. Nos borró de las instituciones, nos borró del poder de, del Estado, de participar de la construcción del poder del Estado. Y lo que te nos queda en estos momentos es continuar incidiendo, pero además también reforzar y agradecer que el tema del decenio es un tema que cruza frontera. ¿no? Y agradecer porque digo que estas causas, cuando se internacionalizan, tienen además un apoyo distinto. No nos sentimos guarichitos o, o solos sino que nos sentimos acompañados en un proceso como este. En estos momentos, ¿qué podemos hacer desde las organizaciones sociales? Es insistir, insistir, insistir al Estado resultados. Y es lo que estamos haciendo, te cuento la experiencia de Ecuador. Y lo otro es que no podemos, o sea, es necesario institucionalizar el diseño, pero con el valor agregado de la participación de territorio. El diseño no sirve y perdón que me exprese así en estos momentos, pero el diseño no sirve si se transforma simplemente en un espacio burocrático. Claro. El diseño tiene que ser un proceso orgánico, territorial, con las organizaciones, con las bases sociales, reconocernos además entre las multiplicidades de lo que somos como afrodescendencia o negritud en nuestros territorios. Si no hacemos ese ejercicio, el diseño va a fracasar. Pero si queremos darle el toque eh, orgánico y además urgente y además activo como somos las bases organizativas, la institucionalidad tiene que ser descolonizada. Y la única forma de hacerlo es haciendo un ejercicio de participación constante. Eso nada más. Con... Muchísimas gracias, um, Juanita. Um, Dr. Vereen, do you have a, any comments around the last question around the well, yeah, I think Juanita has, has dealt with it, that we can rely on, 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 on states, that we have to participate and we have to educate ourselves about the decade and ensure that our needs are not left behind. We have to participate. But I'd also like to reinforce 
what some of the comments that were made before. One, that the decade calls for history education, for the education of our people, so that they understand that their presence, wherever they are, did not begin in 1492. Ivan Van Sertima has written the book, They Came Before Columbus. And we know from history, the history of West Africa and other parts of the world that people were here. We have seen them in the iconographic, iconography of Mexico. And so that I think we empower our young people or children by letting them realize that their history did not begin with enslavement and that they should reject that representation. Also, we have to support Haiti and restart that, that, that support for reparation and restitution of the money that France extracted from Haiti. People only label Haiti. They label Haiti through their economy without understanding the history. And that is the history that we must all learn. And I noticed that a lot, reparation has not become a global, well, maybe not a global movement, but even a regional um, movement. And we need to understand that our economic situation is as it is in this part of the world, in the Americas, in the South, because of the extraction of our wealth created by our ancestors. And yes, I agree with those who say that don't see migration as one dimensional. Think about the civilizations, the culture, how our cultures and civilizations ha have been enriched beca because of, of movement. And the final thing I'd like to say is that we have to hold states accountable when they go. Remember how the third works, you know. S those who have signed on to the convention then are obliged to report to the third about how it is implementing the convention in the country. However, we insist, we always ask the state, did you consult grassroots organizations? Did you consult civil society when you brought this report to us? And we ask them, we insist, you must consult people. But I have to say that people also have the responsibility. You know your country is going before the third. Send your, your input to the state. If the state doesn't take it, send your input directly to third. We, as country rapporteurs, because we are divided into country rapporteurs, we depend on you to ensure that your causes reach the United Nations. If we don't know about it, we can't represent you. And so NGOs are, have the right, grassroots organizations have the right to send what is called an alternate report to serve. We are doing our best to represent you, but you have to help us to ensure that your cause is put um, in front of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vereen. And this is part of the work that we that we are committed to doing, right? Um, I used to work as a program director at the US Human Rights Network, and it was the first um, shadow report process with civil society that was taken right. to the United mm -hmm. Nations. Mm -hmm. Very first. And how what those things look like is that the country, right, the government, the state um, shows up with all their government officials. That's right. And it could be 30 minutes, it could be, it could be three hours. If there's no um, counter from civil mm -hmm. society to the information that the right. government comes with, and the government always says that they're doing a great job, right? And then they go and have brunch, buy cheese and chocolates in Geneva on government and tax dollar money, and then they come back to the United States. In 2008, the very first time that we took over 100 um, organizers and activists, directly impacted people. It was the longest time that the CERD met. Yes. Right, evaluating the United States. Right, and but remember, sorry to interrupt, but remember that um, many of our regional countries, the, the Americas, the Latin America, um, continent of Africa, Caribbean, our governments are not reporting to exactly. the 
yes not they're not um Absolutely. ensuring that your your concerns are represented there Absolutely. second thing i want to say if when your country um calls for the third if you, if if you can't come because it's too expensive who can afford to go to geneva you know and spend a week you can request mm -hmm. this, this type of virtual consultation Absolutely. us i'm saying i know that there are many things to be criticized however let us do what we can you do what you can to ensure that you um stand up and be counted what we do matter and what you do will matter and remember that as i said use what's available and um on the on the decade the final thing i'll say we always ask since 2015 we routinely ask the state party what is your plan of action for the decade for people of african descent most of them have none at all mm -hmm. and some say well we don't have many black people it does not matter anti-black racism exists whether you have ever seen a black person or not for some because it's the stereotypes go before you even before you migrate so you know i just wanted to to say those um to make those statements absolutely thank you very much dr vereen and we are committed as afro resistance to sending out a follow-up email um that's going to have links to to the third to third and also to the other consultations that are currently happening we have one our last comment from facebook and Thank you very much to Tito Lindo del Mar for this. Um, Tito Lindo would like to, oops, sorry. Tito Lindo would like to um, add that there's a lot of black migrants in the Southeast border of Mexico, Tapachula. At the yeah. present, there's a legal situation of black apartheid and racial segregation. Um, and Tito Lindo would like to know if there are articulations with the autonomous collectives of black and African people that are getting organized there. And thank you so much for this talk. So I'm not sure if anybody could address that or in the comments if we could share if people are, um, you know, anybody working with those groups. And Tito Lindo, let's follow up directly um, because we would also want to, um, to um, you know, or to get together with some of those collectives as well. Uh, we are coming to the end of our call. Um, Marie put there the next session of the UN group of experts and people African descent. There is a link right there to the office of the high commissioner of human rights. I want to thank people like Sheila Dallas Katzman that has been on fire on the questions and, and answers and also to um, Kenneth that also had a question. We cannot get to all the questions today. I am so sorry, um, but we these are mm -hmm. ongoing conversations that will be happening. Um, we also have a few reminders because we're committed to um, we're committed mm -hmm. to time right? uh, and making sure that that we honor our participants right uh, and our our audience as well. So we have some announcements right. We have the of course the the Black Girl and Women's um, Fund. Please donate as much as you possibly can. We are getting money directly into the hands of, of people. Um, and oh, Maria already put that link there, which is really great. Thank you. Thank you so very much to the interpreters, Lamar Bailey, Priscilla Abreu, and Alexandra Gomez. Thank you to Beto for his question. Um, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for to Joyce Prado and Ojalá Producciones for producing our videos. So these are, these are just an idea of the things that have to happen in order for these calls to happen, right? There's a lot of back organization that takes place when we're trying to bridge um, gaps that are happening. Thank you to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Claudia Fioroni, Associate Human Rights Officer and the International Decade of People of African Descent. Our next call is about housing um, essential to gender and racial justice in the Americas. That's going to happen next week, Thursday, the mm -hmm. 19th. Um, please sign up. And then there is a call for the next session of the UN Working Group, which the link is already there. Now, we are trying, you know, to really organize a video, a video um, response 
to the 13th session of the Forum of Minority Issues. Um, and the, the theme is hate speech, social media, and minorities. If you would like to be engaged in this, please email Anna at afroresistance.org. The deadline is next week, Thursday. We can submit it by video. So it could be simple and it could be really well, um, will really well organized and produced. So if you're interested in that, please email Anna at afroresistance.org. I'm gonna hand it back to our speakers, Gerline, Juanita, and Dr. Maureen for some very quick closing comments and, and next steps. So I'm gonna hand it over to um, Juanita first, Gerline, and then Dr. Maureen. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, realmente para mí es un placer participar con ustedes, mujeres grandiosas y poderosas. Creo que es importante el reencontrarnos y encontrarnos en espacios que nos permitan hablar sobre todo, sobre todo de temas tan, tan actuales, ¿no? Reconocer que la migración, que el tema de... Eh, son 20 años del Acuerdo 1325 que habla sobre paz mm -hmm. y que además exigía la participación de mujeres y niñas como visiblemente y en sus actorías. Y cuando hablamos de migración y las migraciones forzosas en las Américas y las migraciones negras en América, es indispensable que hay que hablar del significado de paz, de territorio, de comunidad y de mundo, además, desde nuestras actorías y de nuestras voces. Así que muchas gracias y nos vemos pronto. Gerline. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Loud and Thank clear. you so much. Um, I wanted to briefly uh, let uh, Toti, Tito Lindo know that uh, we will have a report specifically on mm -hmm. Black migrants in Tapachula that will be released on um, December 3rd, I believe, I'll send you the information and we'll have a press briefing in Spanish December 3rd at 9 a.m. and in English at 10 to really uplift the voices of, of women, Black women, a migrant in Tapachula. And we are working and would love to also get in touch with you to see how we can collectively uh, bring relief and work on behalf of those uh, migrants there. Um, there's something we say in Haiti, apilme shaipalu, meaning with many hands, the Lord is yeah. lighter. And my call to action yeah. as we sit today, this week on Tuesday, 75 people were deported to Haiti. That includes, as I mentioned, babies and children. On Thursday, uh, on Wednesday, we had a flight to Africa to Cameroon, to Senegal, to Angola. So these are bodies, these are our siblings traveling through the journey, crossing borders unsafely, risking everything safe to try to survive. And we send them back to their death. So my call is to bring our hands together, working with Dr. Shepard, working with Afro Resistance, working with our sisters and brothers, to make sure that we can continue to uplift and move forward as a people. Our citizenships do not protect us. Our immigration status do not protect us in, 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 in no matter where we find ourselves. So let's continue. Apil me shai palu. Apil. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I want to thank Marie Ferreira, who is our communications coordinator. Um, Sara, who's our fellow in Colombian, in Colombia, in Colombia, that is working directly on incarceration issues of women in Colombia. Um, and I want to thank Ana Barreto, who really helped to put this together. Um, she's our program director, and she is behind the scenes, making sure that everything is able to, to function. And I say goodbye. My name is Jambi Williams Comrie. I, I, oh, I thought you were going to give me a chance to say one word. Oh, yeah, sorry. Really. You forgot me. <laughs> because I really want to thank Kenneth Morgan, who put in the chat that um, 
really Cubans in the United States, perhaps in Florida, are not representative of Cubans. And we know the good work that Cubans have done in liberation struggles, in the medical field right around the world, especially uh, in the time of COVID. So I want to thank him for that. I want to thank Beto, really, for forcing us to look at the differences in what people call migration and what we know as the Ma'afa, and to also reassure him that that name Beto is historical in our part of the world in the Caribbean, because a namesake Beto was really a fighting force for liberation in the Caribbean. And finally to say, I'm really happy to have brought some kind of information about how the CERD functions to you and to say to you, please make use of the opportunities of the possibilities of letting your voice reach the CERD when we meet. Everything is on the website. You will know when we meet, you will know which countries are coming up. If it's your country, ensure that we know the right questions to ask yes. and the right issues to raise. So thank you, we are collective. Um, my colleague said, doesn't matter who you are, um, as black people, whether we, we are a professor or peasant, when you appear at borders, when you travel, the stereotypes go mm -hmm. before you and we are treated in discriminatory fashion. So it is a collective work wherever we find ourselves. But thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so very much. And thank you to, you know, folks have folks have not left. Oh, folks have not left us, right? Folks are still um, here with us. So we are going to close out with a poem. I know we're five minutes over, but if you could watch the video, it's a video. It's just really important to us. It's a video by Concesao Evaristo, a very well-known Black Brazilian writer. And we will say goodbye with that video. And until next week, um, Thursday the 19th, we are mm -hmm. talking about housing. So thank you. Uh, mucho amor, muchos besos a todas y todos y todes. A lua fêmea. A noite não adormece nos olhos das mulheres. A lua fêmea, semelhante nossa, em vigília, atenta vigia a nossa memória. A noite não adormece nos olhos das mulheres. Há mais olhos que sono, onde lágrimas suspensas virgulam o lapso de nossas molhadas lembranças. A noite não adormece nos olhos das mulheres. Vaginas abertas retém e expulsam a vida. Donde Ainás, Mizingas, Nagambeles e outras meninas luas afastam delas e de nós os nossos cálices de lágrimas. A noite não adormecerá jamais nos olhos das fêmeas, pois do nosso sangue mulher, de nosso líquido lembrar disso, em cada gota que jorra um fio invisível e tônico, pacientemente pós a rede de nossa milenar resistência. Você vai me pagar, você vai. Vou lhe rogar uma praga, vou lhe fazer um feitiço. Rogar teu mundo. Eu juro, você vai me pagar Cada lágrima que eu chorei Eu guardei só pra te dar E você vai beber Thank you, everybody. Você vai me pagar. Você vai. 
Vou lhe rogar uma praga, vou lhe fazer um feitiço. Joga! Eu juro, você vai me pagar. Cada lágrima que eu chorei, eu vou. Our family doesn't want to leave. Oh, Muchas gracias. Ciao. The participants are hanging out with us still, which is great. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.